Hello and a warm welcome to HT Online. My name is Oli Benyon, I'm one of the associate vicars here and if you're new with us today then I want to extend a warm welcome to you too. Uh, we would love to connect with you and help you uh, get more plugged in at HT and so do go to our welcome page, fill in one of our welcome forms and someone will get in touch with you and help you uh, get more plugged in here at HT. Uh, to tell you what's going to happen during our service, in a little while we're going to have some sung worship. Then Yana Browning, one of our adult pastors, is going to be speaking on Isaiah 53. And then we're going to have a time of prayer. But before all that, we have some notices. Uh, I'm sure it hasn't escaped you that in a week's time, we have Easter, which is really exciting. And during this week, we have a number of events at HT that I would like to make you aware of. So uh, if you would like to be involved in some of them. The first one is on Wednesday evening during our weekly, kind of our regular weekly prayer meeting. We're going to be spending some time reflecting on the, the kind of the Easter events. So that's a chance for us to pray together as a church family. All welcome to that. And on Thursday, we have an event called a kind of a live worship from the garden event. This is going to be live streamed in someone's garden. And this is an opportunity to reflect on Jesus' journey to the cross. Uh, we're really excited about that. Please do join us. You can check it out by the YouTube channel or go to our website and you'll find a link there. And then on Good Friday, we have two events for you. The first one is a reflective service on the, on the cross. Uh, we have uh, invited uh, Reverend Simon Ponsonby to speak to us. Simon is the pastor of theology at St. Aldate's Oxford. He's an author of many books and um, he's a wonderful communicator of the gospel. And um, I'm really grateful that he's been able to record three uh, talks for us that morning. So we have um, a live service in the building at 10.30 a.m. That's You need to sign up for that, but we also have an online version of that also at 10.30 a.m. And then in the afternoon, we have an HT um, Kids Easter uh, Story Trail. That's between 2 and 3.30 p.m. This is an outdoor event open to kind of all families and HT kids. Uh, you need to again go to our website to sign up for that event, but um, all welcome to be part of that. And then finally, uh, Easter Sunday, we have a family service kind of celebration where we would love you to be part of. We have two on-site services that day at 9.30 and 11.30. And if there are tickets available, you need to look on a website. But we also will be showing that service uh, live, um, service at 10.30 online. So uh, there is 9.30 and 11.30 on-site and 10.30 online. Wonderful. That's our Easter services. And then the other thing I want to mention is we're really excited to, uh, to tell you a little bit more about the Finding Faith project that we've been gathering over the last few weeks. Lots of stories and testimonies of how people came to faith. And later on this week, we are going to have a physical copy printed that we are uh, full of stories of people finding faith. And um, you can see a couple of the, the samples of these stories and a little preview on our website now. And you can also buy your own copy at just five pounds, a bargain folks, that just pays for the printing costs. And um, we are really excited about this. And this is an opportunity uh, for you to, to, to buy those. And we will, we'll, you can pick them up on Easter Sunday or we'll be able to post them to you. So we just look forward to being able to hear and uh, just read all these wonderful stories of, of God's goodness to us uh, within the HT family. Wonderful. That is my notices over. Well, a little earlier um, in the week, I had the opportunity to interview our worship pastor, Esther Jane White. And many of us will see Esther regularly leading week in, week out, on, on a Sunday, but this is, was an opportunity for us to get to know her a little bit, but also to hear a bit more about her heart for worship. So here's that interview now. Well, hello and uh, welcome to uh, uh, my home. And yes, um, Esther Jane is in our house. Uh, we are not breaking any laws. Uh, she is part of our bubble and a welcome member in our house. It's a joy to have you. And um, 
firstly, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, what led you to, to Cambridge, and maybe uh, what even brought you to being a, a worship leader in the first place? Yeah, well, I, so I've been in Cambridge now for 18 months, and it's been a bit of an interesting 18 months. You know, we have the first three months, Christmas is always a bit crazy, and then in January, I remember having about three weeks of thinking like, oh yes, I've maybe settled down a bit. And then Rupert announced he was leaving and straight into that, we've been in COVID for a year. So it's it's been an interesting 18 months in Cambridge, but uh, as a worship leader, I guess I really felt, it's often a word we throw around a lot in the church, but a calling. And actually that was something that I really felt God place on my life at a young age. Um, was this sense of calling into being a worship leader. I remember a trip with a friend um, and we were just talking about our future and she said, you know, the thing about you, Esther, is I think you'll probably go off to your own thing, but you'll probably end up working in the church. And as a 15 year old, I turned around and said, yeah, props. Um, so um, I think I think that has been something I love more than anything to see people connecting and meeting with God in worship. So. Well, you're, it's first of wonderful to have you as our worship pastor, but your job has dramatically changed in, the, in this last year. A year ago today, we were all gathered together and worshipping together. For much of this year, that has not been possible. Could you just tell us a little bit about some of the process of what is involved in putting on 52 weeks worth of online services and just give a little insight of that? Yeah, well, it's, you know... I said a huge part of why I love this job is is seeing our church family engage in worship and unfortunately now that that isn't really so much of the job a lot of the time so on a Wednesday night we we record in the church and we um we set up believe it or not about seven or eight iPhones um on stands all over the place and um and we we try we always talk about as a team beforehand capturing worship this isn't a filming this is a capturing a moment of worship but i think what does it look like now i i would say a lot of our job is almost stepping out in the prophetic every week we pray and we're like god what what do you want to say to your church in in 10 days time and then in that moment when normally when you're leading worship every time i'm leading worship i'm I'm praying, God, what are you doing? How are you moving? And and you you get a little bit of give and take, you know, you can see people engaging or you're like, oh, that song's not really, maybe we shouldn't sing that one again, you know. But actually for us, when you're just there with all these phones around you, it's going, God, what are you going to do? What are you doing in this moment? Um, and I'm praying and asking God, guide us and lead us in in what we're doing, even though we're not there with people around us. And let's hope and long, we're looking forward to being able to gather all together without face masks and be able to sing. Yeah. So um, could you tell us a little bit about what your, your heart for worship in the, in the next season when maybe some of these restrictions are, are lifted? What, what, what would you long for um, yeah. at HT? I think something that I've just loved seeing our church grow in in these last 12 months has been this heart for prayer. You know, Wednesday nights, you and... Mm. Lewis have been leading that and it's just been so awesome to see our church family stepping into that and I, I always really feel that worship and prayer are almost like two sides of the same coin that we can't have one without the other and for me my hope and prayer is that as we come back together so many of the ways that we've learned to pray the ways that we've learned to intercede I think intercession is an overflow of of being in God and and my hope and prayer is that worship will be this catalyst for us praying and interceding and seeing our city saved and seeing our city changed. I think on the other side, that's one thing. I think a huge part of worship is it's the place that God meets us in his Holy Spirit and he does works of healing and transformation. And I think that we I remember we talked a year ago thinking when it was only a month of COVID or however long we thought it was a reunion Sunday and this like this you know oh my gosh when we're all back together and we all celebrate and and it's not looked like that and I think you know I think there will be a shift at some point where we do come and we're able to sing but and I think there'll be real joy but I think actually 
we're going to have before we enter into that joy we're going to look back at this last year and and really have to almost enter into the pain and I think that worship is a space it's a safe space for God to meet us and to minister to us and so I think I think that's also part of for some time actually this space to allow worship to facilitate that before we you know before it's like weeping may last for a night but joy comes in the morning i totally agree and i very much look forward to that time when we can gather we can celebrate and we can maybe even dance i know people <laughs> even dance outside of the little square on the in, in church you can actually fully go for it and yeah. uh, sing and worship again so wonderful now um we also know you you are a, some of you may not know esther jane is a is a, is a worship uh songwriter and um, you've, we sing a number of your songs in church. Uh, one of them um, is called Until You Do. And um, that, that's something that, um, could you tell us a little bit about how that song came about? Sure, well, um, a few years ago now, my, my dad really tragically passed away. And, um, and that was a complete shock. It was out of the blue. And I was leading worship at that point in my life. and. I just remember the anger and the pain that I felt towards God and each week as I come to lead worship I just kept the phrase I kept repeating was I'm going to choose to worship you and as I grappled with questions of of suffering and and pain I I remember really you know when we're going through hard things what do we want to have we want to have someone that journeys with us through that people with common experience and I remember having this realisation of, you know, Jesus on the cross as we come to Easter next week. You know, he died on the cross, he took on our sin and our our shame, but he also became a man of sorrows who was acquainted with grief. And he and he stepped into that and and actually um so the song I guess is this one day God will make all things new, but in this interim time, God, we're gonna choose we're going to choose to worship you we're going to choose to trust you and actually for us as we come back into church and many people have had an experience of pain and suffering this year of saying god i'm going to choose to worship you because you will make all things new amazing well we are so grateful for you we're so grateful for the 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 blessing you are to ht and i know many of us haven't had the opportunity to get to know esther jane as much as we are by the fact that you're in our house all the time um, but uh, we look forward to when we can, when it's legal, from next week, Monday, it's legal to have six people in your garden. And uh, maybe Esther Jane could be uh, one of those six, maybe you invite her around. So thank you so much for being part of this and, um, and uh, over back to me in the studio. <laughs> well, thank you, Esther Jane, for sharing with us and giving us a, a little insight into your, into your heart for worship. Now today, uh, churches across the world are celebrating Palm Sunday, a moment when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on a, on a lowly donkey, among crowds of people shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Just five days later, Jesus is dragged in front of another crowd, and this time they are shouting something very different. They're shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Today marks Jesus' final days of his walk to the cross. So let us pray together as we come into a time of worship. Jesus, we come before you with thanksgiving this Palm Sunday. Your great love made you lay down your life so we could be saved. We are so grateful for that act of obedience. Today, we declare that you are our King, our friend, our Saviour. You are mighty to save. Hosanna in the highest. We pray that you guide our every move and let your Holy Spirit comfort us in times of need. Let this Palm Sunday bring me closer to you. In your mighty name. 
Amen. Let us worship together. i 
bleached in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah's death and ruler
Thank you for the great price you paid. And Lord, we ask that this morning that you'd be leading us and you'd be pouring your love out upon us. May we never lose sight of the wonder of your mercy. We thank you. We bless your name. Amen. In a moment, Jana's going to be speaking to us. But first, the reading. Today's reading comes from Isaiah, chapter 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. 
yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Yana Browning. I'm one of the pastors on the team here. A special welcome if you're visiting us today. Great to have you. Uh, as usual, we've got some time together now uh, to look at the Bible together and hear what God would say to us this morning. Now, one of the things that Jesus did right at the beginning of his public life, just as he started teaching and started drawing huge crowds, he went up to individuals, to particular people, and invited them to follow him, to be his disciples, his apprentices. And the invitation usually went um, as simple as this. He would go up to someone, fisherman, taxman, and say, follow me. And that was, that was pretty much it in most cases. Now, somebody pointed out to me this week that um, if someone was to come up to you and make such an invitation, if I, for example, was to come up to you and say, follow me, um, a reasonable question that would come to you would be, where are you going? And yet, strangely, this doesn't seem to be one of the questions that people asked Jesus. They just followed him anyway. But as they followed him, as time went by, as he traveled and taught, it became more and more clear that Jesus did have a roadmap in mind. He had something in his mind that he was working along, that he was committed to, a kind of roadmap. He would say things like, as it has been written about me, so it must be fulfilled. He had a kind of roadmap in mind. What was that roadmap? Well, as part of what we're looking at in this tiny mini series before Easter next week, God had made promises to his people hundreds and sometimes thousands of years before Jesus about what he was going to do. God had a plan. He had a roadmap and he gave some clues, some indicators of what to look for to know that it was coming, some signs to look for as God's plan unfolded. And we're looking at a few of these places in the Old Testament that look ahead to Jesus and what he came to do. And in particular, that look towards his death on the cross and his resurrection. And today we have perhaps the most useful, certainly one of the clearest bits of the roadmap. Isaiah chapter 53, which we've just had read to us again and again, Jesus and his followers came back to this chapter to understand, to explain who Jesus is and what he came to do. Now, there are several, several dramatic differences between this roadmap of God's and the roadmap that we have most on our minds in the UK at the moment. Um, several differences. For one thing, God's roadmap is in a different category of certainty altogether. For another, instead of dates, and statistics. This roadmap is, is prophecy and poetry, which makes it quite different to work with. 
but very much like the roadmap we have in the UK. God's roadmap here is also a road to restoration. It's a path to healing, but it is a far, far more profound kind of healing. It is a kind of restoration that's far more complete, long lasting than anything that even the best of human governments could hope to facilitate. This is God's roadmap to healing the human heart. We're going to focus, as we look at this chapter, on one particular line, the second half of verse 5, where Isaiah writes this, By his wounds we are healed. By his wounds we are healed. That could be a kind of poetic summary of Jesus' whole roadmap, what he came to do, and who he is to us today. So that's going to be the lens through which we look at this chapter together. But as we start, will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we pray that as we look at it together this morning, you would open it up to us in a fresh way. I pray that for those of us who are really familiar with this passage, you would make it um, leap to life again. For those of us to whom this is brand new, that you would help us understand it and connect with it and we just give you this space this time and say that we want to hear every last thing you'd say to us today would you come and meet with us by your spirit and speak to us we pray in Jesus name amen wonderful keep the passage open but let's start um, a couple hundred years ago when there was a rage for a certain kind of product, um, there were a whole host of truly astonishing, truly astonishing medicines um, that claimed to cure not just one or two things, but many, many things. Some medicines that claim to cure basically everything. And this, this is well, well before the blessing of regulation when it comes to medication. Here's an example. Here's a, 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 an example of one from the States, a cure-all. Um, I'm going to guess it's pronounced uh, katakura. Uh, and it claims here to be a positive cure, presumably instead of a negative one, um, for every form of skin and blood disease, which is, of course a lot of different forms. This is extremely impressive. Um, from pimples to, um, I don't know what that is, you can look it up in your own time. Um, <laughs> it goes on um, to explain that you could take it um, as like an ointment externally or you could swallow it internally. It doesn't say what's in it, which to be honest I would want to know. <laughs> An impressive claim, to be sure. And we laugh at claims like this now. There are no cure-alls as if one single medication could cure everything, as if there's only one place to go for everything that could go wrong with the human body. The human body is too complex for that, right? It's ridiculous, and indeed it is. But the human heart, the human heart, the emotional spiritual core of each of us is not so very different to the human body. It's also complex. It can suffer from a huge range of ailments and multiple ones at the same time. Loneliness, fear, exhaustion, a thousand forms of grief, 10,000 forms of regret. Add your own to the list. There are many, many things that leave us sick at heart. But Isaiah here makes an extraordinary claim. Isaiah could see prophetically, God was showing him, that God was on a mission to heal the human heart. God had taken it upon himself to find a cure, a remedy, not for just one or two or for most, but for every last thing that could make us sick at heart. One cure, one single remedy for everything that could ail the human heart. And this remedy to come, this healing, is what Isaiah describes here in our passage this morning. And I want us to notice three things about this extraordinary healing. The first thing to notice is that this healing is a person. 
this healing is in person. Unlike that medication we looked at a second ago, it's not an ointment. This healing is not a pill that you can take. It's not a book with a list of recommended things to do. It's not a breathing exercise. It's a person. Isaiah says, by his wounds, we are healed. This healing is centered in, it's found in a person. And Jesus Christ claimed to be this person. He quoted this chapter 53 about himself directly. On the night that he was arrested, just before his arrest, um, he talks to his followers uh, and before they leave the safety of the room where they've been having dinner, he says to them basically, this is it boys, <laughs> we leave this room, we're as good as walking into the enemy headquarters. And he quotes Isaiah 53, he says this, this is in Luke 22, it is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you, this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what was written about me, i.e. Isaiah 53, is reaching its fulfillment. Jesus claimed to be this person Isaiah spoke of, this healing himself. Now, if you've been coming to church for any length of time, this is probably no great revelation because the answer, after all, is always Jesus. But it's worth remembering for all of us um, that our healing is not a to-do list, primarily. It's not a procedure. It's not a list of rules to follow. It is a relationship with a person. God's great remedy for the human heart is a personal relationship with his son, Jesus Christ, not a list of rules to follow. And many of us know this, but it is so, so easy to forget. God wants to restore us, our lives, our hearts, but not through a list of rules, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, just as we notice this first thing briefly, I urge us, do everything you can to know Jesus better. Do everything you can to know Jesus better. Through him comes all of our healing, all our transformation, all our purpose in life, all the good things God wants to pour into our lives come through him. Do everything you can. Renew every effort to know Jesus better. This healing is a person. The second thing to notice about this healing is that it's the whole package. It's the whole package. By that I mean it seems to include physical, emotional, and importantly, spiritual healing. It's, it includes physical healings. Jesus was a healer, and when he started healing, performing miraculous healings, um, this chapter is quoted. So when Jesus uh, heals Peter's mother-in-law, of a fever, verse 4 is quoted where it says, Isaiah writes, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. They understood that to mean physical healing. Jesus can also bring a kind of emotional healing too. Isaiah tells us in verse 3, He is a man of suffering, familiar with pain. When Jesus comes alongside us, he comes as one who understands and in some way enters into our suffering with us. Uh, a few weeks ago, I heard a pastor say something really helpful. He was talking about pain and how we process it with God, how we take it to God. And he says, um, one of the things that pain does is that it speaks to us. And one of the things that pain says to us is um, God's not here. God's not here. Sometimes it whispers it. Sometimes it shouts, God's not here. But it's a lie. Jesus himself says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And he absolutely included in that our times of most acute suffering. Scripture tells us the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And when we call out to him in our emotional pain and suffering, in our grief, in our loneliness, Jesus can bring us comfort. He is close to us. 
he brings us the most precious, the most precious kind of company. He can bring a kind of emotional healing. But this healing is the whole package, physical and emotional. But Isaiah also talks about this as a spiritual healing, a spiritual restoration. And this is actually what's most on Peter's mind. Peter, whose mother-in-law was healed. Peter, who saw countless miracles as he followed Jesus. When he wrote to a church years later, reflecting on Jesus' death on the cross, he quotes Isaiah 53 heavily, but he pulls out this line about healing and he applies it spiritually. He writes this, um, He himself bore our sins, that's a quote, Isaiah 53, in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Peter, Jesus, Isaiah, they all understood that the greatest act of healing is spiritual healing. And I think this most makes sense to us when in terms of our regrets. And I don't mean, you know, I regret not taking an umbrella that day or I regret, um, I don't know, my, my choice of university course or something like that. I mean, the decisions that haunt us, the things we've said and done that we bitterly, bitterly regret. Jesus comes to offer us healing for the things that we regret. And this healing, this spiritual healing is the healing of forgiveness. Some people think that being a Christian is like signing up to be haunted by everything you've ever done wrong. That's what it means to call yourself a sinner, to just be constantly aware of everything that you do wrong all the time. But I think the truth is closer to this. We all of us, Christians or not, we are already haunted by what we've done wrong. We are already haunted by regrets and we are stuck with what to do with them. We try to forget them. We try to excuse them. We try to make up for them. We try so many things to make up for them. We try a thousand creative ways to lift off of ourselves the weight of regret. And Christians are not signing up to be haunted by their sins. They're signing up to finally be freed of the haunting. Jesus offers the most profound kind of healing. He offers forgiveness. Forgiveness for sins. And this forgiveness that Jesus offers is not a case of Jesus saying, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we all do things we regret. It's no big deal. It's not as bad as you think. Don't beat yourself off about it too much. It's very much the opposite. He does not belittle what we've done. He understands precisely what we've done. He sees it crystal clear exactly how much of it is our responsibility and how much of it isn't. He looks our regrets full in the face and in the terrifying light of day, and he offers us forgiveness. As Pete Gregg put it very well, our greatest need and God's greatest gift is the same thing, the forgiveness of sins. And as incredible as it might seem, this forgiveness can extend over every single regret we carry. And I know many of us know this, but it is easy, easy to forget it. No matter how ugly or catastrophic, no matter how great the betrayal, no matter how many times we've done it, a thousand times and then a thousand times again, this forgiveness can cover it all. It can cover it all. It will not run out. This forgiveness can cover it all. If we bring it to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness, it will be given to us. Our greatest need and God's greatest gift is the same thing, the forgiveness of sins. 
This healing that Jesus offers us is the whole package. His care for us is complete. It lacks nothing. And he works in many ways. He works his healing through his church, through his word, by his spirit, through medical professionals and counseling and friends. He knows what we need. He comes to meet us with healing in every area and particularly, particularly spiritual healing. The third and final thing to notice about this healing is that it's costly. It's costly. I don't know if you've seen any of those um, Febreze adverts or any kind of other odor, or I suppose anti-odor spray. Uh, you know, it's like, does your house smell like fish or does it smell like dog? You can just spray this thing and it's like, poof, and the odor just disappears. It just poof kind of evaporates suddenly, turns into, into gardens and roses and butterflies. Um, well, sometimes I think we can, we can feel like that effect is what happens in forgiveness in the sense that um, Jesus' forgiveness kind of acts like some sort of magic wand that just turns our sins into poof, bubbles and butterflies that then float away, puff, and they're gone. Um, and in some sense, that's true in terms of the relief that it brings us. But quite a few times here in Isaiah 53, Isaiah talks about, he uses the image of bearing things, of carrying, lifting up and carrying away. Remember, this is a poetic roadmap. He describes this healing that God brings as like this enormous weight being lifted off of us, as if we were staggering under something that was crushing us. And Jesus comes alongside and he bears it for us. He lifts it off of us. But the picture here is not that what weighed us down disappears as if by magic. The image is that instead of weighing us down, it is transferred and it weighs Jesus down instead. What would have crushed us crushes him. What would have borne us down to the grave bears him down. Instead, this forgiveness is costly, enormously costly. And Jesus can do this because he has no sins of his own to carry, but it is costly. And in many ways, it's far worse than we think. We understand the weight of those sins that we regret, but we don't like to see the full weight of our sins. Our sins were told us not only make us sick at heart, but they also cut us off from life. They cut us off from God himself. And sometimes we just don't understand, we don't see just how cut off from God we really are. Sometimes we feel it acutely, don't get me wrong, but many times we just don't. There are plenty of sins we suppose are sins, but we don't really, we don't really feel the weight of them. They don't weigh on us. It's like we're numb to them. And there are other sins, which frankly, we'd rather not call sins at all. Sin feels like such an ugly word. But Jesus will not play word games because word games do not bring healing. Jesus comes to take all of our sins, not just the ones that we regret, though mercifully, mercifully, he takes those too. He comes to take them all. And the only way sometimes to understand how serious our sin is beyond what we can feel the weight of ourselves is to see just how much it weighed on Jesus himself. And to understand that, we look at the cross he died on. Isaiah uses another image here. If you look at verse five, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him. We're told that Jesus takes the punishment that we deserve. Because God is a God of justice, our desire for justice in the world is one of the ways we resemble him. He cannot leave wrongs unpunished. He will not. Our sins merit just and fair punishment, which is nothing less than to be cut off from God altogether. And because God is a loving God, he makes a way to exercise both his good judgment and his mercy together. And Jesus comes to bear the punishment 
our sins deserve. The death Jesus dies on the cross is the punishment our sins rightly deserve and he willingly dies in our place. He takes on himself what would have crushed us. Jesus deserved no punishment himself. He had no sin of his own. He fully takes our place, substituting himself in our stead. And this is how, this is why his wounds bring us healing. This healing is enormously costly. And even though it would cost him everything he had to give, he gave it willingly for you and me so that the full and complete spiritual healing, being connected with God finally and eternally could be ours. The full forgiveness of sins, the full restoration, the full healing of the human heart. Now, as we finish, God's plan had always been to work a remedy for every last thing that could make us sick at heart. One thing that could heal every human heart that could forgive every sin and bear every suffering. That was the plan. And it is finished. And what happened on Good Friday and Easter Sunday, it was accomplished. It has been done. And we get to reflect on that and celebrate that again this week. And remember that wherever we are today, whatever weighs on us today, whether that's something great or small, something we've borne for just a few days or for decades, Jesus stands there with wounds in his hands to offer us healing. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much that you had a plan to completely, to fully heal every human heart that would call out to you. Thank you that you, you always know what to do with what we bring you. Thank you that there is never a weight too great for you to lift off of us when we bring it to you. No sin too great, no suffering too great. And we pray that you would you'd show us again today how to bring to you the things that weigh on us, great and small. And we pray that as we look ahead to this week and remember and celebrate again what you accomplished for us, we pray you'd draw close to us again. We pray that you would come to comfort us, to forgive us, and to restore us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to be leading us in our intercessory prayers this morning. I'll be praying for a variety of things, and I invite you to adopt a posture of prayer, whether that be standing or sitting or kneeling. I will leave a pause at the end of each prayer, and I will end that pause with the phrase, Lord, in your mercy. And I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Let's take a moment to pause as we begin to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the time we get to spend together as a church family. Please be with us in all of our conversations this day and every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift to you all we know who are unwell, whether that be in body, mind, or spirit. We ask you to be with them, give them healing, comfort, and your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift to you our broken world with the rise of hatred, violence, and racism. Help us to speak love into situations of violence and hate. 
Help us to see justice in situations of injustice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your wonderful creation. We are sorry when our greed and laziness keeps us from looking after it as you would call us to do. Help us to do better in how we value and care for your creation. Remembering we are part of that creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift to you the world and all those places where there is war-torn and suffering and famine and unrest. Just take some time, a small pause to think of those th places in the world and bring them to your hearts. Lord, we lift these places, whether they are near or far, and we ask for your peace, for your intervention, and for your love to show up in those places in a miraculous and amazing ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, we thank you for your love and grace for us. Help us to know how loved we are by you and always reflect that love to all of those people that are around us. Amen. Isn't it wonderful that we believe in a God that heals and that forgives every one of our sins. The very name that God gave his son Jesus is God saves or, or God heals. It is in his very nature to bring healing. If that is physical, if that is emotional, or if that is most importantly spiritual. So as we respond to what Yana has been sharing with us uh, this morning, uh, we're going to say uh, some words called the confession, where we, where we bring to the Lord areas in our lives. We know that we need his forgiveness, his healing right now. So words are going to come up on the screen, and um, I encourage you to, to say the words that, that come up in bold. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sins and turn to Christ, confessing our sin in penitence and faith. So let's say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoings and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So just take a moment to, to make that personal to you. So may the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to have our final song of worship.
Well, we've come to the end of our service. Uh, before we finish, I want to just mention one extra notice, and that is uh, we have a job opportunity here at HT for someone to become an office administrator and join our incredible ops team here. Uh, um, we are looking for someone who is incredibly friendly and able to be the, the smiley face and the voice to welcome those who are calling or visiting HT uh, in the week, and also someone who really has a passion and love for organizing things and making things run really smoothly. If you would like to know more, then please go to our website uh, for more details and um, it would be wonderful to have you join us. Well, that is it. I uh, hope you have a wonderful Easter week and that we'll see you at one of our different events, but I'm gonna finish by asking God's blessing on us. So may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you this day and forevermore. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of your day.